it's very important to the process of understanding Google Cloud and pass the certification exam that you go through the question and attempt answering it yourself first. So pause the video, work through the question. We'll catch up in just a little while and I'll show you how I do it. This project scenario is based on the Monker Games case study. Monker Games wants you to make sure the new gaming platform is being operated according to Google's best practices. You want to verify that Google recommended security best practices are being met while also providing the operations teams with the metrics they need. What should you do? We have to choose two of these options. Now, if you look at the um, question itself, it's fairly straightforward and there isn't much of a requirement analysis to do. It is more a matter of matching the options given to recommended Google Cloud best practices. So, so let's go through each of them and see if it is a best practice or not. The first one recommends that you ensure that you aren't running privileged containers. So let's understand what containers are and what is uh, what are privileged containers specifically. Now, when you work with virtual machines, right? The uh, when you work with bare metal machines, you essentially get a complete machine with one operating system on which you can do whatever you want. On the cloud, what you usually get is a set of hardware that is separated into virtual machines. So there is a base hardware. On top of that, there is a technology called hypervisor, which allows you to install multiple guest operating systems. So one of them, for example, let's say a green OS is uh, one of the uh, one of the operating systems installed. And on top of that, if you want to run some application, you will have some dependent binary, right? Dependencies like binaries, libraries that you need to run an application. And so that becomes a stack and that whole stack therefore would become a virtual machine. So the actual machine uh, would be this, right? When we talk about machine, it's primarily the hardware and we're talking about this primarily. But when it comes to the virtual machine, then we have virtualized one set of hardware or one uh, specific hardware into multiple potential guest operating systems and the applications that sit on top of them. In this particular case, you can see that uh, these two guest operating systems are similar. They're green OS, while there's another one, which is a red OS. And so these operating systems are independent. These virtual machines are independent and the applications that sit on them see each other as if they're completely different machines, right? So they're virtual machines. There is another kind of hypervisor also that sits on an operating system on top of the hardware. So there'll be the hardware, the, the host operating system, and then the hypervisor, which allows you again to do a similar thing. Here again, you can see that there is a guest operating system and there is a host operating system. All of these are separate, right? So on top of the guest operating system will be the host operating system. Oh, sorry, on top of the host operating system with various guest operating systems. Now, the difference between these virtual machines and containers is that one, typically we don't use a hypervisor, right? So there'll be the hardware, the host operating system, and the containers are separate entities on top of the host OS without their own operating systems. Right. So the key difference that you can see between this one and this one, one of course the hypervisor is not there. Secondly, each entity here has an operating system of its own. Here, there is no separate operating system. Right. So it uses a core operating system of the host of the host itself. And on top of that, only installs the dependent binaries as a part of the container. Right? So that's a key difference between a virtual machine and a container. Um, that here, while there is a single shared OS kernel, here um, there will be independent OS kernels, right? So uh, the operating system at its very core has something called a kernel. And here you can see the host operating system has its own kernel and the guest operating system, any of them, even when it's the same version of the operating system, right? This is a, within a virtual machine, but this is within the bare metal machine. They still have separate kernels, right? So in this case, there are four separate kernels. Whereas in this case, even though multiple applications are running, there is going to be only one operating system kernel. Now, the problem with this approach is that if there was some kind of a vulnerability discovered in the container itself, if you run it with high privileges, say for example, as a root user, 
because you are working with the same operating system kernel, you essentially have a door into the host systems itself, right? And once you have uh, entry into the host systems, you can basically control everything that is running on this node, on this machine, right? So even if there were completely independent containers that are running, a vulnerability could be exploited to take control of this entire operating system, right? In, in take control of the entire machine. So that is definitely not a good thing to have, right? It's a huge security breach. As we saw, therefore, a security exploit in one container can be used to take control of all host resources provided you have those escalated privileges, right? So for a container that has um, privileged access, right? So they're called privileged containers. They become a security vulnerability, right? The best option here is to retain the least amount of privileges that you need to get your workloads to work, right? To get your applications to work. And therefore, by having lesser privileges in the containers themselves for the uh, application that is running it, then the attack surface is also reduced, right? So clearly, this is a very good option. And I am um, going to keep that as a checked with the green, right? At the same time, of course, we also have to see other questions. So just hold on to that for now. Option B suggests that we ensure that we are running obfuscated tags or that, sorry, we're using obfuscated tags on workloads. Now, what exactly are these uh, tags or label selectors, right? So if there is a pod, we can give a human defined um, key value, say for example, to identify that on this pod, we are running a dev workload, right? So within the stages of development, or the stages of code creation and development deployment, all of that, we are in the stage of development. Of course, there could be other details about this pod, right? For example, the tier that it is running is a backend tier, right? So it's running some of the backend applications. We are running version three of the software here. So whatever software running, it's version three. Similarly, on the other pods, we could have different labels, right? So for example, this one is also pod two is also stage dev, but the tier that it is running is front end. And the version that is using is version three. So because we are in dev, we are a version advanced of what is in prod. Prod's versions are version two. And there also there is a backend, there's a front end. And we clearly indicate that the stage of development here is production. Remember, we've just given a short, small example here, but in reality, there could be hundreds of thousands of such pods that are running the workloads. Now, if we wanted to pick up all the machines that are in production, that are running a production workload, and say we want to upgrade to version three, one way is to list out each of these pods and then apply those changes as we want. Right? An alternate way would be to use the labels and selectors to say, hey, get me all the pods, say, for example, the ones that are front end, right? So when we set, uh, well, when we list by uh, labels here, here it is going to select this pod and this pod, pod two and pod four. Similarly, if it did another thing saying that, hey, let's give me all the pods that have got version two so that we can then choose to upgrade those alone to version three, it will give us just these two, right? So these labels, therefore, are clear ways human readable ways in which we can identify pods based on whatever criteria we decide. We can name them as we want. We can identify specific pods and apply certain changes to them uh, from, based on whatever the operations teams requires. Now, the particular uh, option that was recommended earlier was to obfuscate the label itself. Right? So for example, in this case, instead of using dev and prod, we use some random thing like um, uh, hash SDJ 92 and for prod we use ampersand ANR 98. Now how do we get these pods? How do we know that these are front end pods or these are back end pods? This is version 3, this is version 2. It's difficult to do that if we obfuscate the labels. Okay? So this doesn't give us any advantage. Uh, to respond to this option, labels allow users ops to know and monitor workloads. Right, So we can uh, an operations team is able to figure out which operation, which workloads are running, what kind of applications are running, and also choose to pick only those to apply certain changes. Obviously, obfuscating them will make work very difficult because there's no more human readable, right? You still need to then go refer to some other uh, 
sheets, right? Some of the uh, document to say what are these obfuscated labels pointing to, right? What is it referred to? So it just makes it more difficult and that's not worth it. And even with the obfuscation of the tags, it does not add any particular security benefit, right? So it just makes things harder without being useful. So clearly option B is out. Option C suggests that you ensure that you're using the native logging mechanisms. Now, logs are vital to audit systems, right? Um, when a breach happens, you want to be able to go back in time and figure out what exactly happened, right? Did an unauthorized user get in? Did an unauthenticated user somehow use somebody else's credentials to log in? And what did they do? All of those kinds of things we want to be able to capture and then review and audit it later on. So it's vital to all systems, especially cloud systems where, you know, it is running remotely, that we always have logging and monitoring in place. Now, custom logging mechanisms are possible, but they add more effort and overhead, right? You will have to build these out. You'll need to connect them uh, to ensure that the pod um, and the containers, they send out the logs to a correct location. You capture them, you retain them somewhere else. You might have some things where you have to put a sidecar just for the logging mechanism. And all of this adds potential complexity and overhead, right? And it's not going to be uh, very useful to build custom solutions when there is a ready-made solution that is already a part of containers and pods and Kubernetes, right? And it's easy to plug into that logging mechanism than building your own. When you build your own, obviously the chances that you might make an error of some sort, maybe a misconfiguration, will cause you to lose logs, right? And if somebody, say, wipes out the logs on purpose or you lose the logs, you're losing vital information that will help you discover problems later on from a security perspective. Right? So everything considered, it would be preferable to use a reliable, consistent logging mechanism, which is available natively rather than building your own custom logging mechanisms. Now, at the same time, this is not absolutely necessary, right? If you build a bulletproof functional um, logging mechanism without any errors, you really don't have to worry about this so much, right? So this is useful. At the same time, I'm not too convinced that this would be a, um, a, an option to pick. Right? And we won't know if there's one other option to pick unless we see all the others. So we'll keep this at bay and mark it as, as a good possibility, but we'll come back to it in the end. Option D suggests, ensure that workloads are not using security context to run as a group. Now, we saw earlier that when containers have privileged access, it could be a security vulnerability, right? If there is an attack at, um, or if there's a vulnerability within the container, it could give access to the host operating system that becomes a problem. So one way to do this is to remove all privileged access, right? So only allow them to access it as a regular user and say not as a root user. But certain workloads require privileged access, right? You can't, they won't be able to run certain workloads if you do not give them specific privileged access, right? Higher access. So on one hand, running as root is giving too many wide prom uh, permissions and we shouldn't allow that. At the same time, we have to have certain permissions, right? So here again, we apply the principle of least privilege that we give only as many privileges as is required to get the job done. Right. So only very specific permissions. So for example, if they need escalated permissions for some network task, give them only that. If they need escalated permission for some um, volumes or hard disk task, give them only that. But don't give them the network thing if it only the hard disk access is required, the volume access is required. So the way you can do this um, at the pod level and the container level is to specify in the uh, pod spec or the container spec uh, this element called security context that says you are only allowed to run this run a, a container as user with a particular user id right? or as a part of a group with a particular group id and on that we can also specify as part of the container spec to say what are the capabilities that we need right and if the pod allows it we'll give only those privileged access to that container and not everything right so we are um saying if you need to run this particular kind of task here is the permission you should choose and nothing else right so again very specific permissions are provided here now coming back to this the option recommends that 
we do not use security context to run as a group, right? But as we saw running containers um, with certain privileged access is required, not complete uh, root access, but some specific ones. Okay? And user and using security context provides those specific privileges. Uh, and that is a recommended practice that we do, right? So this one says the opposite saying, don't use security context. And therefore that is not a good recommendation, right? We have to uh, remove the general root permissions and only provide specific permissions within security context, right? So option D for us does not work. Option E suggests ensure that each cluster is running GKE metering so each team can be charged for their usage. Obviously, cost management is very important uh, and we need to ensure that we keep track of resources that we are being used so that we can also track the cost that we are paying, right? What is the expenditure? And we can see which team is using more or which particular project is using more. Though it is important, it is not necessarily directly related to security itself, right? So as a security best practice, this is not necessary, but as a cost management best practice, it could apply. So it does not apply to us and therefore option E can be uh, rejected. Finally, at the very end, we saw that option A was a very strong option. Option C was a good option, but there aren't any other options that are better than C. So we can go with A and C for this question. If you find these videos useful, consider supporting me on Patreon or buy me a coffee. Also, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more learning videos on Awesome GCP. Thank you.